whose love I'll sing on. It's a beautiful entry into our next passage, which comes from the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 16 of chapter 4. Jesus has uh, just come back from um, being tempted in the desert. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he comes to Nazareth. Here now, Luke's Gospel. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is God's word for God's people. We're coming now into the third strategy of our new vision. Remember our vision we rolled out um, earlier was to passionately serve in the world because God so loved the world. And we are looking at four strategies to move our church towards that vision. The first was to um, foster hope through grace in Jesus Christ. The second was to, last week, enhancing partnerships within Asbury as we serve together. The third piece today is engage in hands-on ministry in the community. And that's what we're doing using the two scriptures that we read today. Now, in our gospel passage, Luke tells us that Jesus stood in the synagogue on the day of the Sabbath and declared, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. What's interesting is that if you go back to the book of Isaiah, from whence this came, which is Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and you read those verses that Luke said that Jesus read, Isaiah doesn't say exactly that. In fact, Isaiah doesn't say anything about the poor. But Luke is quite clear. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now, if we have been called to continue the work of Christ here on earth, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, to passionately serve the world because God so loved the world, by engaging in hands-on ministry in the community, it might be helpful to stop and ask ourselves, to whom are we to bring good news? Luke says... So what is poverty? What is poverty? And how do we define poverty? The answer to those questions are fundamental because it's, it will set the direction of our ministry to the poor. Now I'm going to show you a clip, a video clip in just a few minutes, but I'm going to invoke the umbrella of grace. Y'all know what that is? That means that I'm going to tell you something with all good intention, and it may come out to be a little offensive, but I want you to hear it with grace. Would you do that for me? The umbrella of grace has been evoked. The clip that we're going to show in just a minute or so is not a critique or criticism of how we're currently in ministry to the poor. That's not my intent to point my finger and say, y'all are doing it wrong. It's not my intent. But what this clip does illustrate is why the two questions I asked, who who is the poor and how do we define poverty, those are so fundamental because how we answer those questions will define how we approach fleshing out how we engage in hands-on ministry in our community. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and that's going to give our board people a chance to get the, the video clip lined up. And then as soon as the clip is done, they'll start the clip. So let's pray. Gracious God, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds as we watch this clip and we consider your words today. 
that we may understand what you may have for us today to apply in our lives, to apply in our ministries for your glory. Amen. The World Bank did a study a number of years ago in which they interviewed 60,000 poor people around the world and asked them the question, what is poverty? And the answers they got were remarkable because while poor people around the world certainly mentioned a lack of material things, they talked in far more psychological and social terms. Poor people around the world will typically say things like this. I feel ashamed. I feel embarrassed. I feel less than human. They describe their poverty in far more psychological and social terms, and we define their poverty in far more material terms. And that disconnect between how they describe it and how we describe it creates a huge problem. That disconnect changes everything. When people describe their poverty, they don't point to their circumstances, their health, or even their finances. They typically point to their sense of self-worth. We subtly feel a sense of pride because we feel like we're making a difference, unaware that at the same time, we might actually be making the other person feel less valuable. Meet Joe. Joe lives in London and owns an internet technology company that he started. He has a wife, three kids, and a dog named Bella. Joe enjoys a round of tennis, coaching his son's soccer team, and a good espresso from his local coffee shop every morning. He's done pretty well by most people's terms and feels like a champ. Now meet Greg. Greg also lives in London, but lost his job over a year ago and hasn't been able to land a steady one since. Greg also has a wife and two kids. Greg and his family live in an apartment for now, but may soon be forced to move because of their inability to pay the rent. Talk about a downer. Greg has been feeling pretty bad too. Not only does he feel like he can't keep a job, the feeling of seeing his wife and kids suffer from his presumed inability to provide for them crushes his spirit even more. Compared to Joe, he feels like he just doesn't add up. Joe has also been feeling a few things. He looks at his life and realizes there are people who don't quite have it as good as he does. And something about that just doesn't set well with him. So, in his true innovative nature, he seeks to satisfy the desire by doing something good and helping those in need. Joe's church connects him to Greg through a local mission at Greg's apartment complex. Joe gets to know a little about Greg's situation and feels pretty bad about it. Joe sees Greg's kids and family and realizes that they may not have enough money for Christmas presents this year. Joe knows exactly what to do. Christmas morning approaches and Greg's family is having a nice, simple time together at home. Then, Joe arrives. And Joe doesn't arrive just by himself. He's loaded with iPods, gift cards, games, clothes, and even a puppy. Greg's kids are freaking out. And honestly, well, so is Greg. But probably for a totally different reason. Joe leaves and heads home, feeling quite fulfilled. But what about Greg? How do you think he feels? Joe just exploited Greg's deepest sense of his poverty, his lack of self-esteem. Not only do his kids see him as a failure, but he feels he'll never amount to the man that Joe is. When we look back at Joe's gesture, it wasn't that he was trying to bring Greg down. He was actually trying to bless the family and bring them up. But still, his actions made it worse. What he did actually pushed Greg even farther into his inward poverty. Not to mention, pushed his own sense of self-pride that much higher. Yeah. When people talk about their own poverty, he said, they talk about an inner brokenness. They don't necessarily talk about their circumstances. When we define others in poverty, we define what we see. We see their circumstances. Because we don't know them intimately enough to see their inner brokenness. Further, when we address only what we can see, we can then make a visible difference in their immediate circumstances, and that makes us feel good, but how do they feel? 
It may actually be our feeling good at the expense of someone else, driving them deeper into their inner poverty. Did you hear that? Now, I'm not saying our intentions are selfish, and our, I'm not saying that we don't care about other people. I know you all well enough to know we deeply care about other people. But we also don't know them well enough to truly address their needs unless we're in a relationship with them. And we also oftentimes fail to acknowledge that we have brokenness, that we also have needs. And for middle class, upper middle class folks, one of the greatest needs that we have is the need to be needed. Perhaps Luke is onto something here when he shows Jesus declaring that he has come to bring good news to the poor. Those who are captive to their own mindsets, those who are blind to their true condition of brokenness, those who are oppressed by that brokenness. The reality is we're all poor. We all fall short. We all experience brokenness. And we need Jesus. And we need each other. Our poverty comes out of broken relationships. Poverty of, of being, that's a broken relationship between self and God. There's a poverty of community, that's a broken relationship between others. A poverty of stewardship, that's a brokenness of relationship with things. Poverty of intimacy, that's brokenness in our relationship with God. That is not how God intended us to be. Because God created us in God's own image to live a life of being in relationship. A relationship with God, with self, with others in such a way that our very lives become an act of worship and praise. Pointing back to our loving Father in glory in whose likeness we're made. Our very brokenness is what Jesus proclaims has imprisoned our ability to see the reality of our own conditions. And it causes us to continue the pain by destroying our hearts and lives and even oppressing the lives of other people, either intentionally or unintentionally. Luke proclaims that the restoration of the human condition to that which God intended at creation has begun in Jesus Christ, who came to repair the breach in our relationship with God. And salvation is being fulfilled today. And the church, consisting of his followers, continues to preach and proclaim the good news by bringing ourselves as servants in Christ's name into the world God so loves. But in doing so, we need to be careful to remember that every single one of us needs Jesus Christ. And our poverty shows up a whole lot differently than somebody else's poverty. It might just be that we need those other people with whom we share our gifts and resources as much as they can share their gifts and resources for our needs. By building relationships first, the community of hope can address the needs of everyone, including ourselves. Relationship has to be at the core of engaging the community around us, whether that community is Zimbabwe, Africa, or that community is Bettendorf, Iowa. Relationship is at the core as we seek the restoration of the world, the transformation of it into God's kingdom. We're to do so relationally, honoring others and doing all we can to restore and uphold human dignity and self-worth because that's grounded in the image of God. God did not create us as a project. We're not God's project. We're not God's problem, so to speak. And neither are we to treat other people like a project or a problem that needs to be fixed. We are created as relational beings whose self-worth and dignity are grounded in who God is. People are of infinite value to God. 
all people, whether they're Christian or not. And that is where we start as we engage the community in hands-on ministry. We have been anointed to bring the good news to the poor in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we're willing to share not just our money and our resources, but to share ourselves, walking in partnership with those who are differently poor than we are, our assets can be shared in such a way that dignity of that other person is preserved and in fact the self-worth is lifted up and we all benefit because God always puts together a win-win. Loving in this way brings glory to God and rest restoration to everyone involved. So when we engage in hands-on ministry in the community, it means we must first acknowledge that we ourselves fall short and that we ourselves cannot possibly know truly what the needs of someone else might be until we know them well enough that we can ask and receive a true answer. Demographics, statistics, material goods only point to circumstances, not to the inner poverty that we all share. Secondly, we don't know the solution because people are not a problem but we are willing to give ourselves in order to work in partnership, sharing what we have, assets that we have, knowledge that we have, engaging in the re true relationship with Jesus Christ at the center of it all. This is a long-term approach to ministry in which we find ways to get to know the community in which we're serving, in which we listen deeply for needs over time and in which we partner with other people, whether it be individuals or agencies who share a like-minded approach. We partner in order to bring hope and restoration through those relationships with Jesus Christ and with others. So when we walk with others in the name of Jesus, God addresses the poverty of the human condition the poverty found in other people, the poverty found in us, that we all share not only the condition, but also the re restoration in Christ. And restoration occurs through those relationships, relationships with God, with self, with others, with creation. The relationships are the means of receiving restoration and giving restoration and engaging in hands-on ministry makes God's love and his work in the world real. It makes God's love and work in the world visible. It makes God's love and work in the world accessible because you see, God still so loves the world and is continuing to be active in it, whether we can see or not. And in engaging in hands-on ministry in this way, we. God's people then become the visible signs as we proclaim that message with our very lives. So may it be. Thanks be to God.